My name is Charles Chauncey, uh, that's C-H-A-U-N-C-E-Y, and I live here in, in Wichita. My former home when I was uh, in the service was over at Chanute, which is about 100 miles east of Wichita here. 74544, that's my officers. We were sending stuff to England, you know, Lynn Lease and that type of thing. And uh, so I, I felt very sure that we were going to, I think President Roosevelt was trying to keep us out of going to war, but uh, uh, they were sure providing a lot of stuff, uh, war materials, that it was uh, when we entered, <laughs> we were already prepared to, uh, to fight a war. My high school sweetheart used to make me uh, do my lessons for the morning bef uh, next day bef before we could do any petting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and actually uh, I didn't go, uh, movies were usually on the weekend, so I, uh, I didn't listen to the radio. Uh, that type of thing. So I, but I, I, I'm going to say it was just a home situation, normal, and uh, but I do not remember uh, Pearl Harbor when it was hit. I was in school, in college, and uh, uh, but when I went to was up to KU, all it just seemed like every week one of the one of these guys was, was getting called into the draft. And uh, I, I, well, I didn't want to be a ground pounder, so I went to Kansas City and, and joined, joined the Army Air Corps. I was really thinking more in the line of, of being a navigator because I thought a navigator used a lot of uh, uh, mathematics, and I was wanting to conserve my mathematics for uh, engineering, and uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I lucked out when they put me into into pilot training. No, actually, uh, it was very educational. Uh, I had been in had physics in in uh, college, and uh, so I I called home. Dad sent me my my big slip stick and. Of course, when it came in, we had physics problems, why, you know, and, and uh, well, these other guys in the class, we want to learn how to use a slide drill. So the t teacher said, well, Chauncey, if you will help, why, uh, but you guys will have to buy your own little six-inch six slide drills, and we'll, we'll do a little course on it. And, uh, this is where I learned, uh, well, well, I met Jack Webb, who later became a movie star. And uh, I spent several hours with Jack uh, in, in his uh, uh, room, teaching him how to use the slide rule, which I'm sure that nobody remembered anything about it. When it but uh, I think they were so amazed how fast you could solve problems. You know, I don't remember much, but uh, uh, I do remember that uh, Jack Webb was all the time making cartoons of the teacher, and he'd pass them down, you know, and it was it was all you could do to keep from busting out laughing, you know. So I, I really, uh, uh, we weren't using a regular history book, that type of thing. It was uh, what the uh, uh, professor had prepared. And uh, so it, it was uh, pretty minimal, uh, but you did learn that, that a lot of these countries in the past were warring each other all the time, and, and uh, uh, some of them had real visions of grandeur, you know, to win the world. So we were there roughly uh, two months. We had, a, we had a captain that was in 
uh, a charge of our, and I never will forget, before we could go out on the weekend, we had to have uh, our package at Countryman's. And the last thing he would say before he let us go was, now men, remember, a stiff prick has no conscience. And uh, uh, I later added to that, a hot box will get its due too, the E.W. And, uh, but uh, I remember that captain, I don't remember what his name was or anything, but uh, that was doggone good. Uh, 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 yeah, very good advice. Richardson, uh, actually it was, that was just a whistle stop uh, for the college. Uh, uh, St. Cloud was the uh, where we went, and you, they had a, a bus on the weekend and take you in, and had had uh, several of them running. <laughs> Well, I felt that, uh, you know, uh, since we had good planes and tanks and this type of thing, and, and uh, of course, when we went to the movies, it was always fun to look at the fighter kills, because they do always, man, that would really turn your, uh, on to get in there and, and get with it, you know. And, uh, but, uh, uh, I knew it was going to be upscale. Didn't know how far upscale it was going to be. We were still pre-picket uh, cadets. Actually, you didn't uh, become a cadet until uh, after you went through all of the, the testing and physical testing, mental tests that you took. And like I say, we were in the Western C Command, and that was done at Santa Ana, California. I remember that the uh, officer says, well, what position would you like to be in the Air Corps? And I said, well, I think I'd like to be a navigator. And he said, oh, the navigator school's full. So is the bombardier school. You're going to be a pilot. they were doing was a lot of pilots that washed out, they put them over into a bombardier or navigator school. And some of them even in the gunnery schools. And uh, so uh, some of that stuff begins to fall into place, you know. And uh, so that was, a, that was real fortunate for me, I mean, uh, to become a pilot. Because I had never flown I think my first airplane ride was back in in the middle 30s on the uh, Ford Trimotor plane that came through Chanute and uh, uh, how they, you know, they, they'd hop from one city to the other, and ride and take a bunch of passengers and then go on to the next, you know. And uh, so that was my first ride. and. Uh, uh, but I did want to become an aeronautical engineer. That was my design. They had a USO there, and uh, so we could go there and dance, you know what I mean, that type of thing. Uh, Jack Webb uh, wrote a musical, and it included everybody within the, uh, in the whole camp. And uh, the only persons that he could, couldn't fulfill was he had to have a, a, a leading lady. And then we, we had a guy that could play the drums, but he, no one would lend him his drums. So we did have to uh, come up with a drummer. Uh, outside, that was the only two people outside. We raised $1,000 and gave it to the USO, and, uh, which I thought was very, very good. When we uh, completed our uh, tour there. Uh, they put us on a tr troop train uh, for California. 
Well, they came down through Kansas City, and I was able to call my folks and uh, uh, tell them uh, they wouldn't get to see me long, probably two or three hours would be about the long way to be the uh, stop there. And uh, so they were very nice and, and brought my high school sweetheart. And uh, so uh, we went out to some former friends that used to live there in Chanute. And they spent all the time with them. And, and so uh, Jane and I were able to have a real nice uh, short time together. That was in Kansas City. Then we got back on the troop train, you know, and of course, every stop they made, man, there were people that brought cookies and and uh, all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and uh, uh, the war effort was was very, very uh, serious and en encompassed everybody. Uh, you just can't imagine uh, the whole United States working this way. And I'm sure that's probably one of the reasons why they call us the greatest generation, because uh, everyone was seemed to be involved. Anyhow, we rode the troop train out to uh, Santa Ana, California, and that's uh, where we, uh, Santa Ana Army Air Base, and, and that was where we were to uh, take all these tests. And if we could pass them, uh, uh, then we became cadets. You completed your your test and that type of thing. Why that? That's when they asked you uh, uh, what you what you'd like to do in the Air Corps. And uh, but uh, uh, while there, we used to go out on Sundays and we just take a a blanket out and lay it on the ground. And there was P-38s that be playing Follow the Leader, uh, six or eight of them. And, uh, uh, and they were all doing it over uh, the air base there. And uh, I'll tell you, he just laid there and drooled. <laughs> it was beautiful. I mean, uh, uh, see those guys uh, pull up in the vertical climb and start doing Corkscrews, you don't hear coming another one up, and uh, I think uh, probably their their speed uh, 51 was probably faster and more versatile uh, over the P38. Now they used a lot of P38s over in the European War. Well, I think they were also over in uh, Africa uh, in that action over there, and uh, but I think over in the Philippines that section over in there that they used a lot of P-38s. And uh, uh, of course, once they, uh, uh, well, I might say that uh, it's, it was two different wars. Uh, the European war was all over land and Pacific war all over water. So uh, you can't hardly make comparisons, you know what I mean? Sure. But the P-51, uh, uh, once they were able to uh, put tanks on them and they could fly to, to Berlin, then that made it possible for them to fly from Iwo Jima to Japan. And uh, uh, I got my first ride in a P-51 uh, this past summer at Oshkosh. I was eating in the Warbird area, and a guy comes through and he says, are you a World War II guy? And I said, yeah. He says, I got a free P-51 ride for you. And the one I flew in had no stick or none of the controls or instruments there. It was just, just like sitting in a box. And, uh, but uh, that was great for me because I, that was one aircraft that I, I really wanted to ride in since we had them over in the Pacific. Well, here again, uh, that, that was, uh, those were based, based mainly in the Philippines. And, uh, and I think some of the carriers 
uh, had Corsairs too. The last and possibly the greatest propeller-driven fighter aircraft was the Vought F4U Corsair I. With their bent wings, the Corsairs are instantly recognizable, but the full extent of their capability is generally not as well recognized as that of other more famous types. However, the F4U could not only outfight the best of the Axis fighters, but also those on the Allied side. Yeah, they were rugged, rugged, and uh, uh, you know the reason why that that wing dips, uh, that it was to give clearance for the prop. A straight, flat wing would would not have their prop needed uh, would not clear the ground. So they brought it down, put the gears there, and and then back up. Well, you know, we had to take a, uh, uh, a high altitude uh, test. And of course, this is done on the ground in a chamber, high altitude air, air chamber, and it's just a big round uh, hot dog uh, with one small when you go in, just a small room there, and then you go into a larger room where I, I think uh, they can hold something like a dozen guys and, and the instructor. And uh, so uh, you go up to 18,000 feet without putting on any oxygen mass. And then uh, uh, he'd do a little talking and one guy would volunteer to, to continue on without putting a mask on. And then they would take you on up to uh, ultimately around 38,000. And uh, the first time that I went in, uh, I passed out at 18,000 before I even got my mask on. And uh, the kid sat next to me, he said, man, he says, you just jumped up and fell over on me. And uh, my clothes were absolutely uh, solid uh, sweat. They were completely wet, and of course they immediately put me in the little room and uh, started decompression then, and and, uh, uh, and it was just a case of nerves, I guess, and uh, they wanted to know what I'd been eating and all that type of thing, and and uh, so the next time, why well, I didn't have any, I didn't have any problem, and the kid that. Uh, volunteered uh, to go without the mask. As I recall, he, he got all the way up almost 28, 29,000 feet before he passed out. And uh, what they did, they had a blackboard that, you're right, Mary had a little lamb on it. And he started out, you know, and pretty good. He'd get it all on one line, you know, and, Higher we go, well, the less he'd get, be able to get on the line, you know, and they'd teach her to wipe it off. And, and uh, so when he finally got up to, just before he passed out, Mary, you know, and it filled the whole board, you know, and the instructor said, well, how you feeling? Never felt better in my life. And, uh, uh, then he passed out, you know, and of course they brought him on back into the other room then and started putting the pressure to him. I think that was to give you an idea that uh, uh, you're going to pass out. The more work you do, the the uh, uh, faster you'll, you'll, you'll pass out. I did fly one mission at 18,000 that uh, the flight engineer forgot to pressurize the, the cabin. And uh, I flew that whole whole mission. And of course, a young buck, why? And I was in good shape, you know. And, uh, but I was damn tired when 
when we got done. We had, our, our crew decided along, uh, right at the beginning, that uh, we would fly our bombing missions pressurized. That if we were going in, we were going in in style. And, uh, but they actually wanted you to uh, depressurize, put your oxygen mask for the bomb run. And then uh, once you got through, well, then you could, you could go back and pressurize again. And, well, if you knock out one of those big uh, uh, glasses where back where the gun, the guns were, uh, decompression is so fast at 30,000 feet. Uh, that it can rupture your stomach uh, from the gases expanding. And uh, so uh, now we had, we had one here in the States at 23,000 that the top, top gunner's blister up there uh, blew out. And fortunately, the two side gunners here did have their safety belts on. But he just picked them up, took their helmets, took everything out of that room, just cleaned it. And uh, fortunately, the top gunner had gone back to use the uh, little patio we had. And uh, so he wasn't there. Now, I, I don't know what would have happened to him if, if he'd been up there when that blister blew. But uh, so we had already gone through this experience once. And of course, at, at that altitude, it, it was nothing like a rupture in the stomach. But I'll tell you what, it felt just exactly like some guy hauled off and hit you as hard as he could in the belly and uh, from the gas of expanding. Of course, uh, uh, those blisters were not made to accept uh, much in the way of uh, hits, you know. And so, uh, and the uh, four-gun turret on the front of the, at the top on the uh, forward section there, uh, there was a, inside in the uh, pilot's compartment there, there was a big, huge steel vat that hooked onto that, and all the cartridges fell into there rather than kicking them out and they could knock the blisters out. So uh, uh, that made it doubly noisy when, uh, when that four gun turret was going. You didn't know where you were gonna wind up, but you had to go through the, through the hoops. Uh, went to Tulare, uh, which was a, had been a civil school uh, Tex, uh, he was an acrobatic uh, winner in, in the 30s. Anyhow, at, uh, there they used civilian uh, uh, instructors, and uh, then the Air Corps would send in occasionally, and you would fly, out, fly with a second lieutenant or lot like that, and uh, checking to see how you were doing. We were flying uh, uh, Stearman. Uh, that's a great acrobatic plane, and uh, I had more fun than you could chase a stick out of flying, flying it. I loved that plane built here in Wichita. And uh, uh, Stearman, uh, then I think they later sold to Boeing, and uh, I think theirs was called the Boeing Cadet. Uh, but I think we were flying Stearmans. And, uh, but uh, we actually even begun, we did a little link trainer work, which was for instruments. Uh, we were learning to fly the uh, link trainer. So it was a, uh, a dual effort there. Uh, but uh, I don't recall of any of the guys washing out 
in the primary. Now, when we got to secondary, uh, there were fellows that, that could not, uh, they couldn't break themselves a flying by the seat of their pants. And you got to fly instruments when you're, uh, and, uh, and then more uh, in advanced left the field. Really more concentration on, uh, you were doing a lot of turns and, and uh, uh, this type of thing, and some guys just just could not learn to uh, separate themselves and couldn't believe what their instruments were telling them. We were flying the uh, uh, BT-13 uh, uh, low wing underpowered. <laughs> and it, uh, but it had a wide landing gear, and uh, seemed like you could almost land the sucker sideways and not ground loop it. Uh, it was good in that area. Not a good acrobatic aircraft. Uh, uh, secondary spins, uh, if you got into that, you, you almost did secondary spins all the way into the ground. And uh, uh, secondary spin is uh, like you do an initial to the right, and then you get around and go to the left. And it seemed like when you went back, uh, it would just almost get into a straight spiral and you, you couldn't get it out. And uh, I think we had, I think we only had one, one kid that uh, uh, died doing that, but he also took the instructor with him. The instructor was, was yelling and at him, you know, to get out, but he got out too low. And, and uh, uh, and it, uh, his parachute didn't have time to open when he bailed out. But uh, it wasn't a good acrobatic aircraft at all. And of course, then they asked you whether or not you wanted to stay sing single engine or, or uh, go into multi-engine. And I chose multi-engine. I told my, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, the bigger, the better. That point, they, they seemed to give you your choice. And uh, so uh, that was done at Taft, California. And uh, man, we were night flying one time and what they would do, they would have four stacks of aircraft at different elevations up. And then they would, as they were working around, they'd take the bottom layer, you know what I mean? and. Uh, then the next layer, and, and it, basically landings. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, landings and takeoffs. And uh, I was up there, and there, Taft, there's not, there weren't many lights at that time out in the, uh, in the area. And uh, man, I banked that sucker over, and, and uh, I lost sight of any lights. Well, I finally kept her in a turn, and finally the lights come on. The old instructor, that's the way to bring her in. And, and uh, man, I was uh, uh, hopping scared at that, that I'd really screwed up, but it all worked out. And uh, the faster they, as their guy got down, the more the aircraft they could get on uh, landings and takeoffs. And uh, so uh, uh, they were anxious for you to really, the higher you, you got in the stack, why to get down, you know. And, and uh, it was a BT-13 uh, consolidated uh, vibrator, we called it. <laughs> Bull T vibrator. Um, well, I passed my test there, okay, and uh, was sent to Marfa, Texas, clear down on the Rio Grande down there, 
and uh, uh, nothing, no t tillable land that you even saw, you know. And uh, there we, we flew the Cessna UC-78 Bobcat. They call them the bamboo bomber, a little twin engine, and uh, it was built here in Wichita. Uh, Cessna uh, built those. That would have been in uh, March and April of uh, 44. I got my wings. Uh, that's where I got my commission, April 15th, 1944. And uh, they allowed us to come home for a month, maybe it was three weeks, you know, to get your head out of the sky, you know, and slow your strutting down, you know. And uh, uh, I knew I was going to end the B-17s. My orders f f from uh, that little vacation was to uh, Roswell, New Mexico, where there was a big B-17 base. They also had uh, C-45s and, and, and they were uh, training navigators and bombardiers there. And uh, at the same time, and so it was a big base, and uh, B-17 was a great aircraft to fly. stable aircraft. I uh, went through regular uh, B-17 train, thought, well, I'm headed for Europe. And uh, uh, fortunately, I was in the top 10% of my class, and, and uh, they put us over into B-29s. And then that's when I went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and, and uh, was told to uh, cut, cut new orders to uh, McCook, Nebraska, was where our ninth bomb group was being formed. And so uh, uh, as gunners came in, they were assigned a crew, you know what I mean? And, and uh, there was three B-29s for 45 crews to fly. So we were flying B-17s and uh, uh, the other pilot, uh, who was actually the airplane commander at that time, and uh, uh, had had never he'd been a fighter pilot instructor, and then when they closed the school down, they put him over in the B twenty fours as as a co pilot. Well, that pilot probably only had two hundred seventy five three hundred hours. Uh, flying and John had a tremendous number of hours, you know, and uh, being an instructor. And uh, so he complained and complained, and finally they uh, it paid off and they put him over into B 29s as an airplane commander. And uh, so I was one of the, I, I guess maybe I was one of the first ones that uh, uh, other crew. And the uh, bombardier and navigator uh, arrived very, all of us just arriving at the same time, practically. And uh, 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 John was a uh, functional drunk. And uh, he was one of those sweet drunks. Otherwise, I think he would have been kicked out of the Air Force. But uh, he was, he was, uh, uh, very congenial, sweet, funny guy, and uh, everybody seemed to like him except Bombardier Navigator and I. <laughs> we had to fly with him. He was a airplane commander. I came in as a pilot. Today you say pilot and co-pilot, 
the B-29 had special consideration because of being such a uh, tremendous advance. It was called Airplane Commander and Pilot. So actually, Airplane Commander was pilot, and the pilot was co-pilot today. Now, I held a pilot rating and an airplane commander's rating. Uh, when they started boosting us up into, uh, into airplane commanders, they called me in and said, Chauncey, you know the problem with John? And I said, I sure do. And uh, he said, well, I'm sorry, but you're going to stay in the pilot position. So they made me an airplane commander. <laughs> so our, our crew had two airplane commanders on it. But I will say this much for John. He could, he, could, uh, he could fly, and he could set that 29 down uh, where you hardly knew that he'd hit the ground. I mean, he could, but uh, I could never tell when he was drunk or, <laughs> uh, or sober. And uh, I asked him one time, I said, John, how in the world do you sober up? when you get up in the morning. He says, I drank two hot beers. And uh, I swear to Pete, he, he was as normal as you and I are con conversing. I do think that he, he slacked off before a mission. And, uh, but uh, when the mission was over, uh, it was party time, you know, and uh, he couldn't even find his own barracks, you know. He, he'd start up the row up there. If the, those guys were there, they'd boot him out and tell him, so he'd go, keep going until a barracks was empty. That's where he stayed for the night. And uh, the B-17 cruised around 170 miles an hour, and the 29s around 200 miles an hour. And uh, we could fly up to 30,000 uh, plus, I think 33 was the highest we ever got. And uh, uh, there was no servo controls on the 29, it was all by wire. And uh, just like 17s and 24s. And uh, so, uh, it couldn't help but be more, uh, took more oomph to do it. With that big rudder back there, you could not hold a rudder pedal in. It just pumps you right out of the seat. And it took two guys to do it. So actually, when you, you needed a rudder, you popped it. You popped it. You didn't even use rudder on, on turns. You made a turn, and that rudder seemed to fall into place, making that turn, the, and the needle and bowl just stayed uh, perfect. And uh, which, uh, if there was a skid, that ball would move in the direction of the skid. And uh, it was just, the ball would just stay centered, just. So actually, most of the time, you flew with your feet up on the, uh, bar up here where the rudders hung down from, rudder pedals. And uh, uh, of course, when you, when you needed them, why well, you dropped your feet down on them, but. Uh. Uh, it was, uh, we had an autopilot, and uh, so I, uh, the minute those wheels left the ground, that autopilot was coming on. And when you got to the altitude you were going to fly up to the Japan, why you know, shut it off and reboot it and, and uh, trim it up just like it, you know, because uh, it was actually working against itself and, uh, when you were you're climbing. And, uh, but uh, 
Uh, it was a, actually it was a pretty nice aircraft to fly. Uh, we used the throttles and, and uh, mixture and, and uh, RPM take off and uh, but the uh, flight engineer fine-tuned it because the linkage lots of times on your throttles is not not quite the same on all of them you know and you can get that wow 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 <laughs> Fine, they they fine tuned it, and uh, force and and uh, flight engineer also took care of the pressurization. And yeah, it hasn't changed any at all. All this, some of the instruments are new, but they're old, refurbished. This is exactly how it looked during the war. Exactly how it, there's nothing there's nothing different. 